I introduced our guest speaker for today's event. He's a very special person. He was educated at Royal College Colombo and he received his bachelor's degree with honors in physics in 1976 from University of Colombo. He commenced his career in astronomy at the University of Pittsburgh, USA, where he completed a master's degree in astronomy. He also read for a PhD at the Australian National University. He completed three first doctoral appointments at Uni Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in Canada, and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He also worked in many fields of astronomy in several universities. He is the former chairman of Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science, and was a senior research scientist of astrophysics. Also, he is a member of the International Astronomical Union. Please welcome Dr. Karvan Ratnatunga, President of Sri Lanka Astronomical Society, to address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you for the kind uh, invitation as well as the introduction. I understand that a uh, lot of the people here are interested in finding out about how they could follow a course in astronomy uh, and sort of become an astronomer. And so I thought of basically talking rather than giving you a lecture on some topic of astrophysics, which I can give you if you are interested some other time, uh, to talk about what is needed to actually get into astronomy and what pitfalls you might uh, that might arise by doing so so i would uh, start at the beginning and i would like a lot of interaction i mean we can do that interaction after in the q and a after i give a, a basic run through but i think the first problem that most people in sri lanka uh, happen when they try to take up a field like uh, astronomy is that it goes against the wishes of their parents. Now, I had the problem because my uh, most parents in Sri Lanka, like my own mother, said that you either had to be a doctor, engineer, lawyer, or at most uh, as an accountant. So those three fields were what was uh, preferred in uh, Sri Lankan parents. And to go against that norm takes a bit of effort. I definitely was, I had decided not to do medicine back in grade eight when you, we had to select actually in form four, whether we were doing maths or biology. And I decided that I was going to do maths because I was interested in astronomy. And then you have the next stage, you finish your maths and then you are in the university. And now if you do maths, you are expected to do engineering. And if you are, don't do engineering is because you couldn't get into if the engineering faculty. Now I could get into the engineering faculty. In fact, I did uh, qualify to get into the engineering, but I, it was no need, use for me doing engineering to do astronomy, which is what you need is more maths and physics. So I didn't do engineering and I went to do uh, uh, physics uh, in the uh, Colombo physics department or natural sciences to do physics degree. That upset my mother a lot. She thought I was going to end up, you know, not having money to live. So she insisted that I do uh, accountancy. So now that's a major problem. I'm sure you all will have the same sort of problem of having to be told that you have to do something which is employable because astronomy is not considered a, a, an employable subject. Uh, field of uh, doing work. I don't know whether it has changed now, but definitely it was the case 50 years ago. So then I, uh, what I did was I had to sit for accountancy exams and how do you convince your mother that you don't want to do accountancy? There's one easy way, 
and I tell everybody, I failed my accountancy exams. My mother gave up trying to make me an accountant. So then I went to do physics and maths and got a first class. And then the next problem, how do you get abroad to do a subject like astronomy? Because uh, astronomy is not a field that is useful for the country. And therefore it is very difficult to get a scholarship or some funding from any place like Fulbright or Commonwealth or any of those scholarships, you may be very highly qualified, but if you want to do a subject like astronomy, you will be ineligible to be uh, go into such a scholarship. So then either you have your own finances or you have to somehow or other get into a university abroad. So I applied to about four universities the first year after my degree. And then there you come to the problem that they don't know who in the world you are. You are applying from Sri Lanka. None of the professors in the university are recognized names in the field. And you are sending references from people who really are not known in the international world. And therefore, it doesn't carry much weight. So you, what you have to do is, if you are going to America, you can always sit for the GRE and SAT exams, GRE, the graduate record exam, and whatever the physics or whatever subject you are specialized in. And that would get you into a US university with not too much trouble if you get very high scores in your GRE, which is all that they recognize. They don't recognize the degrees given in Sri Lanka. So that is your hurdle there. And I tried the first round and I can still remember a, a ripped thing, a sort of a paper, four page uh, letter that I got back from the University of Hawaii. They honestly describe all the problems of doing astronomy, how difficult it is to get a job and how little jobs there are in astronomy. But at the end of it, after about three and a half pages of discouragement, they said, if you are still interested, we need to have those people who are extremely enthusiastic and want to do astronomy, not to earn money, but as because they're intrinsically interested in the subject to do research, which is what I was. So I did apply to Hawaii, but I didn't get in. Uh, Cornell and a few others, I can't remember. So then I next year round, I was quite desperate because I have lost a whole year. So then I needed to get a sure bet. So I decided to apply to University of Pittsburgh, which had a, which had a couple of previous physics department first classes going in there and doing very well. So they said, anybody with a first class from Columbia Uni physics department will be taken because they know their standards. So that was my lucky break to go to America. So one thing, if you go, you have to keep up the good name of the university, uh, your university back in Sri Lanka, because you will be spoiling, if you do badly, you will spoil it for everybody else that is coming after you. So luckily for me, I had two particularly uh, students with the first class who had gone there and had done very well. And that got me into physics department. But after I went there, I had applied to a few other universities. I suddenly found myself accepted with a scholarship to the Australian National University. Then you are in America, you wonder what to do. And I decided I was lucky that there was somebody from the Australian National University who had come and given a lecture 
about how much of good astronomy work was done in the university in Australian National University. That was basically because Australia was one of two countries which had telescopes and could see the southern sky. So nobody in the Northern Hemisphere at that time could see the Southern sky. And therefore there was this area of the sky, which could be only researched from Australia or Chile, which had the other telescopes. And therefore Australia had recognized that astronomy was a field of expertise that Australia would adopt. So that was a good thing and I, understood the importance of that. And I switched from uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, getting a, after getting a master's in about eight months. I didn't have to wait too long and went and did my PhD in Australia. Now, a lot of people can do PhDs, but it is there is room at the top, but you really have to do well and to do well in a PhD means that you have to take a tough problem and solve it. So in Australia, you have to do about a year of coursework um, to get used to astronomy. None of us had any prior experience in astronomy. So I did about a year's working with two other astronomers on small projects before I took on a PhD project. And then selecting a PhD project, which is important because you think. So I had a supervisor who saw my potential and accepted me to do a PhD on a topic that he suggested. And at that time, everybody else told me, the other astronomers in the university told me, don't accept that topic because you cannot do it. It's not, it's an impossible task and you will not do it and you will fail and therefore take a simpler problem, which is possible. But that is not what you should do. If you get a tough problem, then you have to do it. And I will tell you that I succeeded in my career because I took that tough problem and I actually achieved it. And so one advice to you when, if you ever go to the stage of selecting topics of research, take a topic which is uh, difficult and is original rather than doing one which is easy to be done because not others would do it. So from there, uh, getting my PhD in Australia in 1983, I was able to get in to Princeton and that's the Institute for Advanced Study, which is considered the best place to get a postdoctoral appointment because that is the institute where Albert Einstein did his last 20 years of research from 1934 till he passed away in 1954. So that's an institution with a lot of reputation and I was lucky to get in there with a three-year postdoctoral fellowship. From there, I went to Canada's Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, from there, I went to Goddard Space Flight Center, working on the data center. And all those were by invitation, where people actually invited me to apply. And that is the sort of career plan you should try uh, to get. And then I was invited to join the Hubble team in 1992. And from there I did 14 years with the Hubble medium deep survey, which I can talk about if you all are interested. So uh, then in 2004, I got bored with uh, applying for grants uh, to keep myself uh, employed. I had not taken a 10 year job because I wanted to spend all my time in research. And therefore I came back to Sri Lanka and have retired uh, very early and doing other things with myself. So 
I think uh, that uh, career plan I have enjoyed and enjoying myself in Sri Lanka now doing other things, not in astronomy really, even though actually at this very moment, there are some astronomers who are observing uh, occultation of an asteroid uh but uh, occultation of a star with an asteroid uh, on my rooftop i might run away for about 10 minutes just to see but i don't think they'll be successful because it is fairly cloudy out there but they have set up to try to do some observations from my rooftop uh so i might run away in about 10 minutes and keep you away keep away for about 10 minutes you can chat among yourself and i come back uh okay so do you want to me to carry on or shall we now open it up for a discussion so that we can, uh, I can get a feel for what you want me to do. I, one of the things that I discovered while in the Hubble Space Telescope was the first gravitational lens that was discovered with the Hubble. And that's a very interesting story in itself. So I can talk about that as well, showing a few slides or oh, I can talk, answer questions that you might have about uh, anything on how to follow a career to do astronomy. There is quite a few Sri Lankan astronomers, maybe about 15 or 20 as people who have actually done, astro uh, done astronomy and continued in astronomy. I can talk about many people who did a PhD in astronomy and didn't continue to do research in astronomy and went off and joined a, a different field. Uh, it's a field from which you can uh, get into many other fields. I mean, a lot of astronomers have gone into the, getting involved with the stock exchange. And there are many astronomers that have gone in from uh, to do very other work because your training as an astronomer and ability to handle large amounts of data, analyze data, can help you in many other career paths. But staying in astronomy, there's two career paths that you can do. One is to get a teaching job and tenure, and then you won't have uh, much time for research. Uh, or the other way is to be like me, uh, basically get grants to employ yourself to do research, and then it's publish or perish, and also write lots of grants, and grant funding is becoming more difficult now, and therefore it might uh, one day become difficult. So. Uh, so let me see, I've got some few questions here coming in the chat box. So let me try to answer them. I'll talk about the Hubble after a while. Uh, about how do you become a member of the IAU? To be a member of the IAU, you need a PhD in astrophysics. And after that, you, if you are from, in, particularly in US, you need to have a post, one postdoctoral appointment and carry on to a second, because a lot of PhDs in astrophysics in US basically do one postdoctoral appointment, and then that is the, they switch on to some other field, and IAU does not want to get them in as members. They really want to get people who will carry on doing research after a single postdoctoral appointment. So, uh, so let me see, what have you, what course do you have to follow in physics? I think uh, nowadays one, uh, what I didn't follow, but what is most important is to make sure that you have a very good programming ability. I mean, you really need to know how to program computers not just use computers, but program them to get it to get the computer do, to do the research you want. And I think most of my skills 
have been uh, developing software to do astronomical analysis. Right. So let me see. Let me go through the questions. Uh, I'll tell about the Hubble later. Uh, I need to go to NASA one day. What will the A level ma? I think you. I don't know if you can try to, if you get SAT and do very well in your SAT, then you can actually get into a US university. And there are good, two good examples. Ray Jayavardhana from Royal College. He was, a mem he was president of the Young Astronomers Group, must be 30, 40 years ago. And he got into Yale University with a scholarship uh, straight from the O level. He sat for the SAT soon after his O levels and went directly there without even sitting A levels. Uh, if you want to go from A levels, you can't get into a university in America with your A level marks in Sri Lanka you have to uh, get in with your SAT scores. And I think the SAT is best, if you are really trying to get into a US university, you should sit for your SAT after your O levels because the SAT is sort of O level standard in my era. I don't know what it, whether the O level standard now is, but they, they take you into the university there depending on your SAT score plus your age, right? So if you are about the age of people who are getting out of uni uh, school in US and you do very well, uh, then you get into uh, universities there. But getting a scholarship to do undergraduates in the US is very difficult. So you need to have uh, US dollars or money to pay for it. Unfortunately, the Sri Lankan government doesn't seem to have US dollars these days to pay for education abroad. So unless you have people abroad who can support you in doing a, a research um, undergraduate degree. But one thing is that after a at the Sri Lankan university degree, I think is as good as anywhere else in the world. And I think I was more qualified when I passed out from the university in Sri Lanka than when I was doing my master's in Pittsburgh. So I will recommend people who can get into the university here to get into the university here. And I will, my frank statement is that if you think you can't get into the university in Sri Lanka, then you're not going to get into a university abroad and do well in astronomy. So the, the the effort that you need to get into the university in Sri Lanka, especially to do physics or mathematics in the Columbia University, is much less tougher than getting into astronomy and succeeding in astronomy. So don't see that. There are people, students who have said, I know it's difficult to get into the university here. Then don't try to get into astronomy. You have to have... You should be able to get into a university here if you are going to succeed in astronomy out there. Or the other part that only other people that I have seen going out there and doing well, uh, Ray Jawadhan and another girl who sat the same time as her, him and did so well in the SAT after their O levels, right? And they were accepted to the Yale University. Okay. So physics, physics, astronomy, and computer science, those are what you really need to do astrophysics. And now there is a ability to do biology and there is a field of astrobiology. I don't know anything about it because I don't have a biology background. So uh, finishing A-levels without getting into a degree in Sri Lanka, uh, these days, I think the, the funding is the biggest uh, issue. So I would think that getting into the university out here should be the best bet to uh, do um, uh, to get a basic degree because it's fairly easy, or at least it was in my time, 
to get scholarships to fund you you can get a teaching assistantship a research assistantship to fund you to do a degree in uh, us but it's very difficult to get so any sort of funding unless you are really brilliant like reja wadana to and sat for the sat to get funding for undergraduate work but you have to be young and smart for that so you should try that sit for the sat if you are in the o level just after your o level sit for the sat and get very high marks you will stand a chance if you are in the university then you should finish your degree in uh, uh, physics mathematics and computer science and if you are in a levels then i would suggest particularly consider in the difficulty of getting us dollars to fund uh, education abroad uh, even if you have a lot of rupees is for you to do your degree in the university in here and then carry on from there after a first degree so astrobiology is something i really don't know about because i stopped doing biology after my L o uh, my 8th grade even though i think it's a very good uh, subject to do astrobiology uh nasa actually you have to consider when you say the word nasa nasa is a huge organization and there are a lot of people working at nasa in different subjects right there are um, uh, people who are developing instruments there are people uh, doing basic research like i did and you know there's a full spectrum i mean each of the centers in nasa would have about 10000 people working there and it depends on what you want to do so uh so is it possible to be a good physicist living in any country or only you know i think you can be a physicist in any in, uh, in any country i mean the problem is if you are getting a taking a teaching job then no problem i mean there are lots of teaching jobs if you want to be in basic research then you have to be good at it and if you are good at it there is always room at the top but it is not easy there may be some useful astronomy done from my rooftop today that's the sort of thing that you have to be persevering even in cloudy weather to <laughs> get weather i uh, get uh, astronomy data so anyway i'm very happy that uh, they were able to get some observations okay so let's uh, go through some of the other questions are there 16 new messages so let's go through the other messages uh, i am from india ms in astrophysics uh, the us they do actually watch sky and do observational things while studying there ah i mean we don't uh, look at the sky i mean astronomers don't really uh, observe uh, with their naked eye i mean it's all instrumental all the data now is mostly coming from things like the hubble so it comes as an image uh, down you get the image digitally and you analyze the data there's very there is no sort of naked eye observations i mean even upstairs when they were taking thing there was a camera and nobody was watching it naked eye there was a camera ccd camera taking photographs or um, a series of photographs of the uh, asteroid occulting the star and with time and then you would analyze that light curve to find out the diameter of the asteroid so uh, so they were about four different observations sites uh, there was one been taken at the arthur c clark center one group was doing it in battramulla and another group was doing it at chandana jayaratna was observing from the colombo university i hope he was and there was a group doing it in ruhuna so if we have observations from all five places then we would have be able to put some constraints on the diameter of that asteroid 
So that's the sort of observations you can do from anywhere in the world. And when you really have to observe through a telescope from Earth, but uh, most of the observations are done from uh, space uh, as from space and you get the data uh, thing. I was told, I remember I told you that Australia emphasized, had a private view of the Southern hemisphere and therefore could do astronomy, uh, especially which nobody else could do. But that advantage went away with the Hubble really, uh, because the Hubble could observe the whole sky and you did not have to be in Australia to observe the Southern sky. Now the latest tel telescope that has gone up, which is the James Webb telescope, uh, would be able, will be able to do a far better job and it's not on Earth orbit. It is about a million miles away in the Lagrangian point. So it won't be bothered by Earth light and you will get fantastic data compared to the Hubble even. And we are in for the next few years to get fantastic astronomical data. So if you can do a PhD and get involved with the data that is coming from the James Webb, uh, you would be at the cutting edge of doing research. Um, okay, uh, what? Should an engineering student select career in as, as most of the engineering students I know would be doing uh, instrumental development. Um, that is a major part uh, of astronomy is to actually develop the instruments that you want to do the observations. So there are people like us, Sanat Gunapala from JPL, his expertise in developing instruments to observe the sky. So uh can you enter for a uh, foreign university like oxford university by not doing a levels in sri lanka i don't i think the british system is a bit stricter you i don't think you can uh, do get into british universities without doing a levels because they also their students also do the a level and the british uni oxford university undergraduates is uh, sort of not like the, it's more like the Sri Lankan undergraduates uh, rather than the American undergraduates, which is slightly above O level or the old days O level. I have no idea what it is relative to the current O level. And their U US universities, all they want is a good SAT score. And if you get a say, good SAT score after your O levels here, yeah, then you have no problem. What are the main goals behind the Mars mission? Okay, Mars mission is, I mean, we, wa we want to be able to live outside the earth. I mean, one of the old justifications was that if a major asteroid hits the earth, then all life on earth will disappear, could disappear like the dinosaurs. Maybe it is for the best of earth and that we want, life won't disappear, but at least humans, be, uh, humans will probably disappear if a major asteroid strikes the earth. So we have now a fairly big program to actually try to discover all asteroids that are more than 150 40 meters across. And if we uh, do that, then uh, we won't we'll be able to spot any asteroid that is going to do major damage to the Earth. And then if we have sufficient advance notice, and we know it's going to happen in 10 years time, we can actually go and send a sort of a mission to that asteroid to either move it from its current orbit and therefore get rid and get, remove it. So another possibility is that if we do have life, a permanent base on Mars with people living on it, then human race has a security that we are also living on Mars. And if you have a small population of people living on Mars, then we'll be able to come back to Earth in a hundred years after the strike and repopulate the earth. I mean, that is 
one of the justifications of doing Mars. But other than that, there is, I mean, maybe the Earth will become too populated and we want to move out to new territory. After all, that's what people did in on Earth. I mean, when Europe became too populated, they migrated to Europe. To Australia and to uh, the Americas, and sort of disrupted the civilizations going on there. But I mean, the next step would be to have a permanent base on the moon as well as on Mars. Mm. Is a BSc in physics that I should follow the universe to get into astronomy or any other courses? I think a, be a special degree in physics or mathematics or computer science would give you the skills needed. I think if you do computer science, you will have to do physics as well. Uh, physics with uh, mathematics special, the like Colombo campus doing physics. You have to have a bit of physics, whatever, to do astronomy. Or if you want to do bi astrobiology, then the same thing goes with biology and uh, uh, mathematics or biology and computer science. Uh, I think computer science is essential nowadays. I mean, unless you actually depend on programs that are written by others and use them, a lot of people do their PhDs that way, but you really cannot do a cutting edge uh, their program or PhD depending on programs written by other people. If you really want to break new ground, I think you really need to be either mathematically or computationally working out your own tools rather than depending on other people's tools. You, if you depend on other people's tools, then you would end up not having a PhD, which should be in demand, which would mean that you would be in demand among others, uh, st other institutions to get your postdoctoral appointments. Uh, let me see. Uh, let me go down further. Can't we enter foreign universities like, okay, that I said. Well, if you take, what are the careers in NASA, I think, every possible, I mean, if you just want to work at NASA, there is all possible careers at NASA. I mean, uh, there are most of the research places, uh, I think they cover all aspects of astronomy. So, uh, I'm an O-level student. Can you tell me more about the SLT? Uh, SLT, not SLT, it is, uh, SAT, SAT is the O-level uh, scholarship aptitude test, SAT exam. I mean, if you go to the American embassy website, you would find about SAT and uh, you really need to do well in that if you are after the O-level. And if you do really well, I mean, I think, I, I don't know what it is now. I think uh, they score you out of 1600 points. There are two papers, each of which is 800. And I think the, uh, um, this one, uh, Reja Vodhana got something like 1,590 or something, really sort of at the top end of that uh, scale so that he really cut out about everybody else. Applied Max, Pure Maths and Physics, that's exactly what I did myself. Uh, to for my A levels, uh, so computer science. I think you can. I can. I think you can get into computer science with that, and I think computer science skills. Now I did learn all my computer science myself. I never did a course in computer science, so I self taught myself computer science. If you want, if you if you do that, you know physics. I think physics is useful. Pure maths. I don't think I don't think pure maths is all that useful. Uh, applied maths, physics, and computer science would be my topics that I would use to do a degree in order to do get into astronomy. 
I, the problem you are talking about, and it's a lot of people sit for the British A levels rather than sitting for the national A levels. Uh, the problem is that if you use the British A levels or Excel or whatever that is uh, that is now called, is that you can't get into the Colombo University or the, any of the uh, universities in Sri Lanka, I, as I understand, and then you get stuck in having to either fund yourself for universities in the US and that gets into a problem. At this point, I would like to warn you, I mean, I think this is essential to warn you. There are a lot of universities, small universities in the US that will offer you scholarships, right? And you feel, wow, they are paying half my scholarship uh, but they actually, uh, so you think that if you pay the other half, uh, you can get into that university and um, you are at advantage. But if it is a small unknown university, there is absolutely no advantage in going there over going to the university in Sri Lanka. I will tell you a case that I personally know and actually somebody from Sri Lanka who had done her uh, high school degree in the Middle East, contacted me while I was in the US and asked me, I'm wanting basically to go to a small university in the US. I, I knew her grandfather and she was really ex interested in going to this small university. I looked at all the details about that university and I said, don't waste your parents' money, do your degree in the uh, first degree in the Middle East or even come back to Sri Lanka and do something. It is not useful to get into that university. But she was so determined, she uh, got the funding from her parents and she somehow other got the visa, came to that small university in, I think it was in Connecticut. And then within a month, she wrote to me and said, I'm desperate. I can, they, they are not teaching here. They are not doing anything here. And they are only interested in making money and they are not interested in doing any teaching. The teachers are horrible. So I told her, I warned you, I told you not to come, but you still desperately came and you are now spent your parents' savings and you are in back in square one. Luckily, she was very, still very enthusiastic and she went to transferred after one year to another university and was able to succeed over there but she was very lucky. If not, she would have basically had to go back to Sri Lanka with absolutely nothing after wasting their parents, um, her parents' money. So be careful about universities that offer you, small uni unknown universities that offer you scholarships because they may not be what they talk. There are, uh, you should uh, look up, if you are interested in a university, you should look up something called the, uh, US and World Report, which gives the grading of all universities. And if it if the university is not in the top corner, a quarter sort of there are they divide it into four groups. Um, uh, the uh, top quarter um, sort of the sec, uh, half, fifty percent to seventy five percent, and then most of these universities were below twenty five percent in the great ratings. And those universities, even if it's under 50%, it's no point going and spending money and doing a degree there. The university degrees from the Sri Lankan university is, will be far better. And you can do it in English here, right? You definitely, you should do it in English, not in Singhala or Tamil. You should do it in English here and you can do it. The science, department, science degrees are in English, so do it that way. I have a... Astrology, wow, what has astrology got to do with anything here? Astrology, if you want, is absolute bunkum. Uh, you can make money in Sri Lanka, but I don't think you'll make money anywhere else. So I'm 
I'm sort of surprised you use the word astrology there. Uh, anyway, astrobiology, uh, you may have wanted to write astrobiology and ended up the spell corrector may have corrected you to astrology. That's amusing. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, when you would get done, that would be a great turn to appreciate our. Yeah, I mean, we can have more sessions like that. I have no problem helping people uh, to get together and chatting over various uh, topics. I think that's why I agreed to give this lecture. Ah, at age 14, to develop a career in astronomy. I mean, at age 14, I was, uh, let's say, whatever, when I, I was in, I was, there is, most of the schools have, astronomy societies and we used to get you at Royal College where I was studied. I used to do be the uh, president of the Astronomical Society and we used to do a lot of observations. We had a telescope and get familiar with the actual astronomy because if you go, I have met astronomers in US, very high brow theoretical astronomers who have never looked through a telescope at the sky. So I think it is useful to have a background in amateur astronomy before you do astronomy, because if you become a pure theoretician, like I have few of them I met abroad, then there is certain aspects of astronomy that you don't uh, really understand fully if you don't have that amateur interest in astronomy. So I would recommend you getting that amateur interest in astronomy before even becoming a theoretical astronomer. There was a question as to what sort of astronomy I did. I actually started uh, doing my PhD, a PhD where I was asked, there was, a, there was no distant uh, K-giants, I'll have to explain what uh, the first front Russell diagram, there's no time to do that. I can do a lecture on the topic at some point if you're interested. And there were no observation, uh, sample of them which have been discovered basically because there are red stars, you could find all the red stars, but then some of the red stars are dwarf stars and some of the red stars are giants. So the idea was how do you identify a sample of red giants which are far away from the sample, the huge number, majority of the stars which are red dwarfs, which are nearby. And that was the issue. There was only about one or two percent of the stars which are red giants far away in any sample. And therefore you had to do spectroscopy, which is not very easy to do on a very large sample. So I devised a way of getting what they call a prism. You put a prism on top of the telescope and get a little spectrum of every star. And then I wrote some software to scan all those images and image process them using a computer which I couldn't get more than 50 kilobytes of uh, program size. And that was what you could get in 1978 when the fastest computer, or 79, I think, when the fastest computer I had, had one megabyte of main memory. Megabyte, not gigabyte. Megabyte of main memory. And you could write the programs which took 50 kilobytes. So I had training in a, uh, on programming so that when I worked with the Hubble, I could do very efficient programming. Okay, I'm getting sidetracked here. Uh, special reason behind the honeycomb structure, the James Webb. I mean, the reason is that you cannot build a lens which is larger than a certain dimension. Once you get to about four meters or five meters, I think the largest uh, diameter telescopes that have been made is eight meters, but you would not be able to launch an eight meter telescope. So I think these are about three meters across and you have got a whole array of them. The Hubble is, was two meters across. 
and you got a full array and they went in folded uh, with each other and then opened out. Now they have all been opened out, all the mirrors have been opened out and now you have to focus, um, point all the mirrors in one direction and be able to uh, get uh, those uh, mirrors lined up together, which is what they're doing now. So there was no way that they could have launched a telescope as big as the James Webb unless you had a honeycomb structure. Yeah, I mean, Mars, I think uh, the problem with Mars, when you go to Mars, is that you have a lot of cosmic ray radiation, which we are, the Earth is protected because of uh, that, uh, the Earth has a fairly big magnetic field. And from the magnetic field, it has created the Van Allen belts around the Earth. And they would basically trap all the nasty cosmic rays and solar winds that come towards the Earth. And very little except that solar uh, with that would actually come into the Earth. And therefore, we are protected by that as well as our atmosphere. Mars has very little atmosphere and it doesn't have the magnetic field to create the Van Allen belts around it to protect it. So the radiation on the ground uh, would be very strong and you would have to go underground to have a civil or have a sort of domes which are protected enormously. It would be cheaper to go underground to have a thing. Mars, I think that way would be thing. Europa and Titan are so far away that they would be pretty cold and you would have to have a lot of energy to keep yourself warm. Uh, you will have to start some nuclear reactor fusion. Once you get fusion energy set up, if you set up a fusion uh, source in Europe or Titan, then you may be able to get enough energy uh, to live there. If not, it's going to be tough because the sun is so far away and it is so cold. Mars will not have that, those problems. I think it is sufficiently warm to go underground and live. I mean, this is what you need to get, uh, uh, get involved. There are a lot of opportunities. I'm not sure uh, the bioastrobiology. I don't think uh, many have gone from Sri Lanka and got involved with astrobiology. There are a few like uh, Chandra Vikramasinghe's daughter, which, who did astrobiology. And, but I think she has left the field. Uh, I don't know of anybody else who has done astrobiology, something that I know very little about to talk about astrobiology. Maybe you can invite somebody else to give a talk about astrobiology. My knowledge of astrobiology is similar to a popular knowledge of astrobiology. But I can do, I do remember the time in the US must have been around, uh, 1995 or between 1995 and 2000 when uh, Dan Goldin was the director of NASA and he came to a meeting of the American Astronomers Association and he asked please show me a show of hands as to how many of you have a biology background among that huge assemblage of maybe a thousand astronomers and mostly physicists. And as far as I remember, four people put up their hands. And he said, in five years time, I want to make astrobiology as big as astrophysics. And that was sort of something that uh, upset a lot of us who were physicists, but that is what he said and that is, Therefore, uh, NASA has got into a lot of astrobiology, but uh, that is really on the strict end of astrobiology rather than the astrobiology that Chandra Vikramasinghe is talking about, which is panspermia, which is not really accepted 
by the mainstream astrobiology people. I think, uh, I'm not sure about RMIT. I know, I mean, Australian National University where I did my PhD is about the best university to do astronomy. I mean, they are really have Mount Stromlo Observatory, which is the main astronomy uh, place and they have access to the telescopes. I think that really most of the high-end astronomers in Australia at ANU but Melbourne and uh, Sydney both have fairly strong astronomy groups, uh, which interact a lot with the thing. Uh, Mount Stromlo is almost the only uh, dedicated astronomy department in Australia. Most of the other astronomies are associated with physics. So that was the case when I went there in 1978, I don't know what the situation now is. There may be more individual astronomy fields. Okay, so I mean, most of the astronomy that I created was uh, to image analyze. I mean, astronomy gets a lot of data from uh, uh, space as well as you whatever you get is in a digital format and you want to get uh, science out of that and one of the problems that i worked with in the hubble was we are getting a lot of data uh, with the hubble with the medium deep survey which was a parallel program so that we got more data than anybody else and I, what my software was doing was to automate the analysis of that data. You could do that sort of analysis on a manual way. And I was a specialist in automating it. Now there are a lot of tools in doing it, uh, things like artificial intelligence and that sort of uh, software I'm sure is applied to that sort of field. But when I was doing it, you know, you did it the hard way of actually locating all the objects in the sky, taking, finding out, separating out overlapping images and analyzing the image using a lot of statistics. And as, as, so I used a lot of statistics in my programming. And at that time, there were other programs which have been written by other people guided by astronomers. Unfortunately, a lot of the software, astronomy software has been written not by the astronomer, but by the, and as a, by a computer scientist guided by the astronomer. And I found a lot of software really had bad statistics. And I realized that to correct that sort of software was much more effort than to develop my own astro astronomy software, which is what I did for the Hubble, as well as for all my data analysis. And um, there's no easy way out of assuming that somebody else has done it right. And you can use that data because if you do that, then you might get results which are wrong and misleading, or you can't understand. So I, I did a lot of software development at the Institute for Advanced Study. I did a lot of software development for modeling the distribution of stars in our galaxy, uh, in addition to doing that sort of image processing. So, I mean, it's open. There is a lot of data coming in from space and the amount of data that you get from space is so large I think you, you can sit in Sri Lanka, take archival data. That's another thing you sh I should tell you about is that all astronomical data taken with public funded telescopes like NASA, a NASA funded, right? Like the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb. Well, after one year, that data has to become public. So anybody in the world can request that data, get 
sort of some sort of grant, maybe get even a grant to analyze that data, but clearly the data is available for you to download and analyze yourself. I mean, all this, uh, most of the space program data is all available just to download. And you of course have to know how to analyze that data. But if you know, know how to analyze that data, that data is available for free. In fact, I mean, I was involved with the medium deep survey. At that time, there was a dedicated uh, telescope uh, set of observations done on a something called the Great Growth Westfall uh, Field, which was actually observed by the people who developed the instrument, the wide field planetary camera. And we were doing parallel observations with the instrument, which were never as good as the dedicated observations done with guaranteed time. So I felt that a lot of the science that could be done with that, with that data would sort of overshadow or any science I could do with the parallel data. And I felt cheated because I didn't get this data right at the beginning and the others could get it. But this data became public after one year. And I could analyze that data fast because I had automated software, which I had developed. And the data, um, the data was taken in April of 1994, became public in April of 1995. And I was able to discover the first quad gravitational lens with the Hubble Space Telescope in that data. That data had been with somebody else for a whole year and they had not done the discovery. In fact, later on, I discovered that they had actually observed it, uh, discovered it around March. But since my paper uh, that I published was the first paper published on that gravitational lens, I get credited with that discovery. And that is the was the first gravitational lens discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope. So public domain data is there. If anybody could set up themselves here in Sri Lanka to do that sort of data analysis. After all, there was a, a, a student, graduate student, uh, not undergraduate student who worked at the uh, Arthur C. Clarke Center with uh, data got from Kepler and found a planet around another star. So that was done from Sri Lanka a couple of years ago. So you, the data is not a limitation. There, now where you are in the world is not a limitation. If you are in Sri Lanka, you can do astronomical research. The computers are not a limitation because now you can get very powerful computers that are sort of needed to do this sort of analysis for not very much money. So actually there is no limitations if you are enthusiastic to do fundamental research. And if you want some help uh, getting started, I can do it. Um, I've not done it for 15 years, so I'm more rusty about the current way that things are done, but I know when I soon after I came back, I wanted to set up the Arthur C. Clark Center people to do this sort of research because I had all the software and I had all the expertise to teach them to do this research. But there was not much interest there, so I didn't follow it on. Okay, do you think it's worth doing the Dublin University other than space field, other than Sri Lankan University? I have no idea about. Uh, Dublin, but I think uh, the all my previous comment about uh, uh, Dublin is a fairly good university. I don't really know about astronomy there, but uh, my comment is that with the current um, uh, dollar crisis in Sri Lanka, which is only going to get worse. I don't think you should, uh, it, it, unless you really have dollars abroad you should plan on doing that sort of thing because halfway through your career, you might find Sri Lanka going bankrupt and not being able to send you uh, dollars for your career. So if you have money abroad, uh, which can fund your education or you are very lucky to get a scholarship, then 
I think you could go. Uh, you should go abroad. I, I'll tell you one of the drawbacks. A lot of people say, "Why don't you do a, a, a astronomy?" A, a, I sort of do it in Sri Lanka and go abroad. I think the only place that I felt I was at a disadvantage in going doing my research after doing a first degree in Sri Lanka was the fact that I was about few years, at least five years older than other students who were parallel with me doing a postdoc, right? I was five years older and that is a disadvantage, right? So that was because I lose one year after my A-levels doing nothing uh, thing. You may lose two years these days. And then after your university career, you will use another two years and I lost a year doing a master's and coming back to do a PhD. And therefore I was about five years older than some other stu uh, students who were parallel to me uh, in the, for example, at the Institute of Advanced Study. I had a parallel colleague who was 24 and I was 30. So. That is a disadvantage. So I think that is the reason if you can get as get abroad as as early as you can and do your degree there, then you get that advantage of a couple of years more uh, when your brain cells are better at doing research. Okay. I think there's a whole lot of questions. I think we have now gone to about 20:30. Let's try another half an hour or so on this. Uh, should we do mathematics to become an astrobiology? I think you need mathematics and computers to do anything these days. Even, I mean, biology is also becoming, and a lot of the biology that I see it being done is a lot of astronomers I know who did uh, physical uh, astrophysics switched on to genetics. Uh, genome, uh, gen, uh, gen, uh, gen, after the ge ge genetic code of the humans was sort of uh, found out and there was the th th three billion base pairs. I know of a lot of astronomers who took that database to analyze that database and understand that uh, genetic code. And I think that is a field which is really becoming up and coming. And it's something that there is a lot of work to be done. And I think that is the serious astrobiology would be there, which will require a fair amount of mathematics. I don't think you can do uh, astrobiology without a very strong mathematics and computer science. So maybe there is a field of astrobiology which you can do with uh, more with biology background, but. Uh, I think the new fields of astrobiology is not mathematics. Most of us ask, uh, where did we come from long ago? Answer to almost the same as God made everything. That answer makes us uncomfortable spiritually, uh, feel comfortable spiritually, but there is answers for those in modern science. I actually wrote, a small piece on the scientific view of uh, the universe and I can uh, share it with you. I will uh, type it in here on the thing. You can go to that website. I think I'm timing it from uh, memory. So uh, maybe I got it wrong, but I think this is the, ah, okay, there you are. Uh, that came up uh, on my thing. It's lakdiva.org slash astro. And let me send it to everybody. Uh, everybody in the meeting. Oops. Uh, I got something else. I had to delete this. Oh, clearly. Why isn't this deleting? Okay, did to everyone. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so that website has where I discuss a lot of things, and I have extensively linked that uh, 
short piece to Wikipedia articles to go expand yourself on any of the topics that I mentioned. And I'm hoping to do put more links to Wikipedia articles and other links, other subjects. But I discuss uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, astro the scientific view of astronomy, the size of the universe and the problem I have with uh, God made everything is that if you take the age of the universe to be one year, which is 331 and a half million seconds, then each second, cosmic second, I mean, this is a concept that was brought by Carl Sagan in his uh, video cosmos and it, i think i will recommend all of you all to watching cosmos because i don't think there's been a, a better pro, uh, film set of videos on astronomy than cosmos by carl sagan and there is an updated version of cosmos but still with carl sagan which was done around 1999 uh, updated with modern images, and that's as good as the old one made in 1978. But I would recommend that over what was made by Neil deGrasse Tyson a couple of years ago using the na same name, but uh, it's not as good as the original Carl Sagan's period. And that he talked about uh, making uh, one year equal to the age of the universe, and you work out and you find that each cosmic second is 437 years. So if you divide by the 13.8 billion years by uh, 30 uh, by 31 and a half million seconds. So then you realize that our civilization is about 10 to 15 seconds. So why would somebody uh, invent a simulation, if we are a simulation created by God, why would somebody create a simulation uh, for a whole cosmic year if the, what is happening is in the last 10 seconds of the year? I mean, it seems to be sort of very slow start to human civilization. So that's my answer to why I, be, I don't accept the concept that uh, uh, God created everything because it does, you don't know who created God as well as uh, you don't know thing. But there are a lot of issues that I talk about, which is the chemical evolution of life, which can be solved by talking about the anthropic principle and also the cosmological constants, which give you a problem which can be resolved if you go to the multiverse. So those are the questions that I've answered, asked in that uh, uh, thing. And maybe we can do another session where people read that article and we can discuss the various issues. So let's stick to uh, uh, sort of topics here on study, getting into astronomy and as research. Uh, uh, to do research, how do you to do research? I mean, if you are talking about research in Sri Lanka, then I think I answered that question that if you want to do astronomy research, you can get all the data you want from, uh, from the top end telescopes. Uh, I'm not sure whether I got to all the questions, but I will, if there are any particular questions that you want me to answer or we can discuss at a, uh, another meeting. You are free to email me. I will put my email address uh, to everyone. You're welcome to, uh, to write me an email if you are interested, rather than a general question, if you have very specific question. And we can uh, some physics question need some help with some physics questions. Uh, don't ask. Um, I mean, if they are astrophysics, then I should be able to answer. But straight physics is something that I did um, 
40 years ago and I'm not sure whether I'll be able to remember those things. I'm now completely away from astrophysics and now doing um, uh, new, uh, museology and numismatics and uh, sort of forgotten a lot of the old uh, physics, so even though I do remember a lot of the astrophysics. Uh, don't help, I don't think I'll be able to be able to help you with physics. Uh, so, uh, to study astronomy about the universe, stars and galaxies as higher education instead of... Okay, I mean, I think if you want to do astrophysics, I think you need to do physics and astronomy uh, and mathematics. If you want to do rocket and spacecraft science, then you would better be an engineer, right? I think uh, there is more opportunities. There's two things. One is applied science, which is what uh, as, uh, rockets, uh, rockets and spacecraft and all that is more applied science than basic science. So what I was involved with is basic science, which is uh, sort of no practical use for anybody, maybe a practical use in the future, but it was nice doing something which uh, was fundamental uh, to understand in the nature of the universe. Observational astronomy, I think, does not almost exist uh, because I think I did more observational astronomy than astrophysics. Uh, I, I did observational astronomy to the extent that I was analyzing the data and getting the physical astronomical observation, observational data out of the digital images and do it and less doing the astrophysics. But finally, you have to do the astrophysics uh, to get the real science out of it. So I think astronomy, observational astronomy goes into astrophysics. Uh, uh, I, didn't I send you an email ID? Let me uh, type it again. I thought I sent a uh, wait. Uh, to everyone in the meeting. <laughs> okay, did that go? Okay. I think I sent, ah, I had also sent it as a direct message. Sorry. It flipped on me. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so what else do we want to talk about? We have maybe about, oh, we are going to, uh, let's try or carry on till about uh, uh, nine o'clock. And let's get on to any topic uh, in astronomy. I'm quite willing to talk. I hope you all have found my lecture interesting. And I leave it to the moderator to carry on. <laughs> yeah, I have also received some questions from the audience. OK, why won't you ask them and I will answer them. OK, sir. So, so the first question is, what is your take on how we can combat certain indoctrinated superstitions? Ah, that is a very tough question. I mean, that is more, I should give you a whole lecture on that. Uh, indoctrinated superstitions, unfortunately, most of the superstitions are given to you when you are between the ages of zero and five, or one and five, say. And those last a whole lifetime. Now, luckily, I was, didn't get any of those indoctrinations between my age, so I didn't get indoctrinated into any religion or any superstitious beliefs because my parents didn't. Uh, my mother believed in astrology, but my father didn't and didn't push my push that sort of belief on me. I have be I'm a member of the Rationalist Society of Sri Lanka. We try to have a, we have a WhatsApp group there, very active talking about these subjects of how to get rid of indoctrinated uh, things. But if you get indoctrinated when you are small, you have to break through that religious beliefs. And I think, uh, 
unfortunately, I would say Buddhists also, which are not supposed to believe in God, believe, most of the Buddhists in this country believe in God and a lot of other ritualistic stuff or gods, if you say in the plural term. And unfortunately, I am uh, was born a Buddhist and I don't uh, accept that Buddhism has rebirth, nirvana, or karma. So if you can think of a Buddhism without rebirth, nirvana, or karma, and has only the eightfold path and the four noble truths, I'm willing to accept. Otherwise, I generally call myself having no religion, nirvagamika, and try giving, uh, giving that to a police station when you are trying to give a statement saying that you are Niragamika Lankika, which is where I didn't want to say what race or religion I was, and they wouldn't accept that. So there is our country has a problem in that. Uh, but uh, I think you can fight it. And one of the things that I want to fight is to try to get uh, those uh, facts that, for example, in the census, it asks you what your religion is or I'm told that you cannot give, sign an affidavit without not giving your religion and race. So uh, I think uh, the, my Singhala is okay. I can, I have actually gone live in Singhala, but I'm uh, not very good in Singhala. Well, Monoada Danaga, no, you please uh, come verbally and ask a question in Singhala. I will try to answer in Singhala, but I'm not. Uh, comfortable. Luckily, I gave up my Singhala. After, I sat for my O level and A level in Singhala, but I was luckily be able to give up my Singhala in the when I entered the university, which was, I could do it completely in English. I had problems when I had I passed out and became a lecturer in the university for one year, where I had to do a tutorial in Singhala, and I sort of dread that time. And I went 25 years abroad, not having to use Singhala. Come back here and I have actually gone on a few live programs in Singhala. If you look up YouTube, there's a lot of programs that I have done in uh, Singhala. Yeah, I was a frequent uh, participant of the program Yata Rupa, which I'm not sure whether you all have seen. Unfortunately, the government didn't like our anti-astrology stance and uh, refused to uh, stop it after about two and a half years. We are trying to revive it, but I don't know whether it's for politics. But this country believes in astrology too much. So astro, there is a question about astrophotography. I think uh, that's a fabulous field. And, and now the people upstairs on the rooftop were actually doing astrophotography of this asteroid occultation. And they got some good images. Uh, so if, if you, but from Colombo, it is not easy. I mean, uh, they were observing a seventh magnitude star and they just wanted to see whether that was, what whole, at what time it got occulted. So, uh, what is the best way to spread knowledge of astronomy among Sri Lankans? I don't know. I mean, if you want to be, uh, I have been sort of involved, but to tell the truth, I mean, I'm hoping that somebody else will take over from me uh, and be the astronomical society. I mean, I have been nominally holding the post for the last 15 years. And I think it's time that somebody actually took that over and ran an astronomy, so national astronomy thing. I think there's a lot of uh, individual astronomy clubs in schools, but there is no national astronomy club. And I think you should uh, create one and I am quite willing to help in it. I was. I was helped a lot by the Astronomical Society of, that was quite active in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, 
patron was Arthur C. Clarke, and there was quite a few active astronomers. There is people like Rex de Silva who still do some observing from Sri Lanka. There's a few groups doing astronomy here. I'm not sure too sure about them. They have not contacted me. But if anybody wants to be seriously starting an astronomy pro, uh, group, um, they can even do it online now. You don't need to physically meet. Uh, you can have it online, a WhatsApp group. We can, I'm willing to answer questions uh, on the topic. So we can do something. If you all have a set has a WhatsApp group, I can uh, be an honorary member of that and try to answer some of your astronomy questions as much as I can. I think there is a need to create, uh, there are quite a few astronomers, all Sri Lankan astronomers abroad. Uh, there is Nalin Vijay, uh, Nalin Samarasingha, who is doing asteroid research in, uh, in Tucson, Arizona. There is Tilak Hevagama, who is doing a lot of instrumentation, solar astronomy, which he, he was uh, involved with the Kepler mission. And he's at Goddard Space Flight Center, and he must be one of the few Sri Lankans who are actually employed by Goddard. Most of us were not employed by NASA. We were on research grants funded by NASA. It's quite a different to be actually employed by NASA, and I don't think there are many Sri Lankan astronomers. I don't know of any other who is actually employed by NASA other than Tilak Hevagama. And then there is uh, quite a few astronomers like Ray Jawadana, uh, uh, Kure, uh, who is in uh, University of California, or he was in University of California, Los Angeles. I think he should be there. There is Hiranti Piris, who is in, I think, in Oxford, University of London. And there are quite a few astronomers around the world. I'm sure they will all help. And if they are sort of contacted into joy, uh, at least watch, having a separate uh, said group for with them, which may be more because they may not like to join a group which has a lot of chatter. So if you have a moderated said group uh, which should have serious questions, I'm sure they would be willing to join that said group and answer those questions. So we can, I'm quite willing, I'm uh, not uh, working anywhere. I'm quite willing to join sessions like this and uh, answer questions to you on, I mean, did this topic, we can do a topic on the Hubble and what I did in the, on the, in the, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can do, various topics we can, I would love to do one as focused on that uh, short uh, article I wrote about the science view of the universe. I mean, I would like to discuss that and see where, whether I could get that, that understanding to those who are keen on science and astronomy to get a see whether that will give them a picture of what the universe is and discuss certain concepts like the anthropic principle. So let's do that. So uh, best site to do astrophotography in Sri Lanka, not Colombo. And that's why it's a pity that our only telescope we have, which was installed at that 18-inch uh, telescope is installed in Marutua, which is fairly light polluted. The places that are uh, good is at a, you need to be at an elevation as well as uh, in the dry zone. So places like uh, one of the places that was site tested to be a good site for an observatory was Ritigala. But I don't know whether the strict uh, nature reserve will allow you to put a telescope up at Litigala. But uh, there are places fairly high up. You want to be about a thousand feet above the sea level at least, I think. And uh, look for a place which is in the dry zone, which is not as cloudy as Kala 
it has to be uh, less light polluted as well. And I have been, I can remember going to Kilinochi soon after the war was over. And wow, it was so dark and the skies were so clear. I've never seen anything like that from Sri Lanka. I don't know what it is like now after Kilinochi has become a much more populated city. But there are a lot of areas in that day, northeast, which is, uh, I think, far away from the lights. And if you can get a telescope out there, that would be nice. And nowadays, you don't need to have, you can have an automated telescope out in those regions. I know that the University of Moratua was trying to develop an automated telescope. Okay. What else? What are the other questions? So there's another question, sir. Uh, what happens to space-time when cosmic coll objects collide? Space-time is warped by gravitation, right? I mean, that is why you see gravitational lensing because the space-time is warped and the light is also bent and you see lensing happening. That's a separate topic in itself. Uh, objects do collide. I mean, uh, you could get a lot of problems if two black holes in the center of galaxies merge to make a, a, a single large black hole. And that would happen over time, where in about 700 million years or a billion years, when Andromeda is expected to m interact with the Milky Way. So that sort of uh, interactions are observed and depending on the interaction and uh, depending on whether you get black holes merging, it will give you what will happen to the space time. I and mean, space time will be warped for a short period of time because of the inter gravitational interaction, but um, there's nothing happening to the universe as such as a whole. What you have to understand also like, I told you that we are a couple of sec our civilization is only a couple of seconds of the cosmic year. You have to realize that the distance from the Earth to the moon at the speed of light is one and a quarter seconds. It's eight, eight minutes to the sun. The solar system is five, 10 hours across. The closest star is four years. Our galaxy is 100,000 years across, light years across, and the edge of the universe is something like 45 billion light years away from us because the universe has been expanding. So that is another video that I will link to that same article. So I think uh, that's uh, space time is thing. Time travel, I don't think is possible. I mean, there are a lot of sci-fi stuff written about time travel, but uh, I don't think there is any practical. But if you go close to the speed of light and come back, then the Earth would have gone a lot more than you would have gone. And that is a straightforward uh, result of special relativity. And that is that holds. There are a few astronauts who have been computed to be a few microseconds um, uh, younger than they were for their long duration of space flight, but that's a very small effect. Uh, but it is a mesh computable effect of what uh, going around the Earth at 18,000 miles per hour will do to you. Uh, I want you to create a WhatsApp group and I will try to uh, get through to me, if not get through to me by email. I'm not such a big WhatsApp person as such. I've only recently got some myself WhatsApp and it's not there on my regular number. Uh, I tell you, if you want to watch videos, the best uh, channel that I have watched recently and those programs are very good is on the da vinci channel the da vinci channel is a kids channel it's available on both uh, po tv and dialogue uh, it's a kids channel till about nine o'clock in the night or ten o'clock in the night 
uh, from about nine o'clock to midnight, they have very adult and very good programs on astronomy and a lot of other fields of science, right? Mathematics, astronomy, biology, all those fields are very well covered in the Da Vinci channel at a level that I'm sure an A-level student should be able to understand. And I would recommend that well, I watch it a lot. And I used to not like that basically because it happened late in the night and I was, I never liked to watch TV at a particular time. And the Da Vinci channel was not available on playback on PO TV. But now it is available on playback on Dialog TV with the new VIU2 hub. Right? If you get that on Dialog TV, then you can play, play it back. They claim that you can play it back for three days. I have not been able to do that, but you clearly can play it back for one day. So in the afternoon, you can get the last night's programs. And in the other one is Discovery Science, which unfortunately has a lot of advertisements. But with this hub, you can fast forward over the advertisements and get rid of all those annoying advertisements and watch only the program. But I will tell you that the remote that is sent with this hub is very difficult to learn how to use. Once you learn how to use it, it, is, it works beautifully, but they don't give you a handbook. They don't give you anything on the internet. So you should complain about it to dialogue to try to get the thing. If you want, I will try to have a session if you are, if there are any, any people interested because I worked out how to use that hub and the playback facility. And once you learn how to playback facility, unlike PO TV, which has only BBC and the local channels, Dialog now has about 20 foreign channels in addition to the local channels. And they include BBC Earth, which is very good, uh, uh, Discovery Science and Da Vinci Channel, which is, I think, the best for astronomy. Okay. Mag magazines on thing, I think there are a lot nowadays. Uh, the local magazines I have generally not liked at all. In fact, I've worked against them because they tried to mix up all the UFO nonsense with the astronomy. And I have strongly spoken against anybody, any magazine which tries to mix up UFOs and uh, astronomy, because I don't mind programs doing astronomy, but I don't like programs doing astronomy and nonsense. So I have spoken against it and I won't recommend the local there was something called Taruloa or something which was doing that. And it closed down after I talked a lot about it and against it at many astronomy events. And now I think they have come back alive. I have not seen what it contains. So uh, what else? Uh, so that is the TV channels, I would think. Uh, that is, on the internet, YouTube has enormous amount of uh, science programming. You just have to search on any topic and there is a lot of things. If you go to something, if you are, if you are interested in more advanced uh, lectures, uh, then uh, the Hubble Science Space, Space Telescope Science Institute has a if you go into that website, their website and go into the YouTube, their YouTube channel, I think they have about 100 or 150 lectures on all topics of astronomy at a very undergraduate level that you can watch. And under, there be all, research, all their research lectures are available on YouTube. On, I think it's a YouTube channel and there is no advertisements on those either. So that's an enormous uh, resource. Like that, I think most of the other universities have their lecture programs 
And nowadays you have got more because they're on Zoom and you may be able to even get into their Zoom lectures uh, like that. I have not gone into finding Zoom lectures, but I think most of the Space Telescope Institute lectures, you can join on Zoom. Any other questions? Uh, yes, so there's another question. With okay. your experiences, could you tell us how to follow your career path and new trends in today's astronomy explorations? Uh, I think I basically told my career path at the beginning, and that's the reason I described my career path because some people might get clues from it as to what uh, what to decide, what avenues to decide. And I think uh, that's what I said right at the beginning. If you you really have to be, you know, I'll do astronomy if I'm going to even starve after getting a job. Uh, you can't expect, you know, to make the money you would uh, make as a computer scientist or uh, most other business fields, you would most probably make a lot more money than you would do as an astronomer. But I have uh, the advantage that I never had to wear a suit or tie. I have not worn a suit or tie since 1982 in my life. So I could go in my shirt sleeves and get up at whatever time, go and work at whatever time I wanted. And uh, I was free to do whatever I wanted. And it was do research, publish, and peri or perish. And uh, I have now been, I think the only time I signed in and signed out of an institution was for the eight months I was working at the Space Telescope Institute where they wanted me to clock in and clock out, even though I didn't feel that I needed to clock in at nine o'clock and clock out at five o'clock in the evening, they wanted me to do that. Uh, other than that, I don't think ever I have done that ever in my life. I didn't, I didn't, I needed, I used to take, I decide to go abroad and come back to Sri Lanka for a few, few weeks and never wrote a leave application. That's the freedom of basic research. I mean, that is then you can do what you want and do research. But you have to be, to get that luxury, you have to be self-motivated to do the research. If you are not self-motivated, you would uh, not publish and you would perish un unless you are in an institution like the Arthur Clark Center, where, you know, if you get a permanent job there, maybe you can carry on doing nothing, which is what they're doing. I'm sorry to say that they have not produced many research papers as they could have, because there is no motivation there. So, go abroad, uh, get a place, and then if you want to come back, then you can come back and get into one of these places. There is no limitations as to where you should, could be to do science. You can be anywhere in the world and do astronomical research now because the data is available right through from foreign databases. You have no limitations. And some of the Hubble data is even reduced. So you don't need to do and understand how to do the basic uh, anal data combination to get finished data to analyze. May not get the best because you don't know how well those people combine those images but there is a lot of science that can be done with the finished data that will be available from the archives. Or if not, you can go and get the raw data, combine them in a better way and get the science out. It's not easy. Uh, there is a lot of things that you need to understand to reduce that data. But a lot of that data is available and there's a lot of help to do it. So, but the easier way is to go abroad get involved with a large space program, which is getting a lot of data. And then if you don't get a research job abroad, then you can get access to that data after coming back to Sri Lanka. Okay. What else? So Thank you, we... sir. Okay. Uh, think... So this is the final question the audience had sent me. Okay. Uh, do alternate universes exist and whether we could traverse from one to another? Is this in science fiction or in real life science? No, it's definitely in science fiction. 
uh, whether alternative universes exist would be the need for multiverse or the concept of the multiverse is something that I touched upon in that short article that I sent a link to, is that we have fundamental constants which seem to be fine-tuned to create uh, atoms and therefore oxygen and nitrogen and life-forming uh, 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 atoms and the elements. And therefore, you could not uh, do that uh, in another universe where the fundamental constants, some of those fundamental constants like the fine structure constant, if it was different by about 4% and there is nothing in physics which says that it should take the value one over 137.06 or whatever it takes now, it could be any value. So then somebody could ask, why are the fine, uh, 19 fundamental constants of the universe current in our universe fine-tuned so that it was conducive to create life. We know that life originated on our universe because we exist. So the only way of getting over that problem, the two ways, one is to say that God exists and we are a simulation of God, which is not something that science likes to accept, or bring the concept of a multiverse where there would be an infinite number of universes, each which are multiple of combinations of fundamental constants. And we happen to be in a universe where the fundamental constants were right to create life and, create, uh, and chemically evolve life, and then we are there observing that universe. So that brings us a need to have a multiverse. And I think that's, uh, but we, there is mathematically, you can say that there is currently no physical interaction between two multi universes. There has been some theories that there may be some gravitational interaction, and there are people who try to. Uh, explain dark energy, dark matter using that sort of gravitational interaction, which is all speculation. It's not in accepted uh, science. So currently, with the accepted science, we cannot have, we cannot interact with a different universe. Uh, we wish we could move from one universe to another universe and maybe get out of, get to a universe that Sri Lanka looks like Singapore instead of what it looks like today. <laughs> Sorry for that political comment. <laughs> okay, shall we close up today? I'm quite willing to come in again and have a chat with you today. I am very happy that a lot of people ask questions. I think I hope you are keeping a record of the question so that if there is any specific question that I have not got to, I will try to answer it. And how about creating a small moderated uh, WhatsApp group and we'll try to get uh, a few of the other astronomers also involved with that. Sure, sir. We I will create a WhatsApp group and add you, sir. Okay, we'll have a moderator and WhatsApp group so that you don't get <laughs> too many questions. Because that way, if it is a moderated WhatsApp group, I think I can uh, request a few other astronomers to join in with that group. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, sir. No problem. Thank you again, sir, for the amazing knowledge and the experiences you shared with us. This was a very knowledgeable and fascinating session for all the space enthusiasts gathered here today. Again, a huge thank goes out to our guest speaker, Dr. Karvan Ratnatunga, for taking time out his busy schedule and gracing us with his presence here today. Thank you, sir. Also, I would like to thank Mr. Nalika Gunavardhana for introducing us to Dr. Carbon, which made this today's event possible.